I mean, the distinction about what he is is lost in the hyper-reality of his smile, which, like the Cheshire cats, you know, just gleams across his face. And we get for the first time a phenomenon never known in polling, which is the phenomenon of not liking a person, but of liking liking a person. It is popular that he's popular. The postmodern trajectory leaves us in a situation where drawing the line between the real and the unreal is no longer merely philosophical, but a practical day-to-day -day issue. See, this is what I want to drive home. We're not off in some fairyland. This is a practical day-to-day -day issue of figuring out what's a simulation and what's not. Is this guy really an insurance salesman or is he here to rob me? You know, I mean, these, the, the, this, is, this is no longer Cartesian doubt that one has to conjure up in a meditation. This is a wide, radical doubt about the very ground beneath our feet. Baudrillard says it's best at this point to simply face it that what we are witnessing is the end of the world, the end of human beings, and he thinks that there's no reason to be sad or upset or cynical about it. In spite of this, we have to, to look upon uh, the end of man, the world, and so on as an opportunity. Because what were these concepts anyway? Like, the man, like man and world, except concepts by which the world was regulated, policed, mapped, and controlled. In any case, the, the, the current political structures are way behind this curve. They don't understand it well at all, in spite of all the talk about the selling of the president. That's very old-fashioned. We all have lived with advertising for years. What we haven't lived with are ads that have more narrative structure and meaning than the programs. And where we see an image that reproduces us as inhuman, occasionally we see an image that somehow has the bizarre transcendent power to make us slightly more human again. But it's along that terrain, I think, that the battles and the struggles, the self will fight with itself, will be fought in the future. So when you get a book that's banned, that means there's something in there that you need to know. So this book is called History of Central Banking. What does Hitler, JFK, Lincoln, Gaddafi, Napoleon, Julius Caesar, Tsar Nicholas II have in common? They all tried to do state banking and they all got either killed or thrown into a war. In 1943, the following directive was issued from party headquarters to all communists in the United States. It read, when certain obstructionists become too irritating, label them, after suitable build-ups, as fascist or Nazi or anti-Semitic, and use the prestige of anti-fascist and tolerance organizations to discredit them. In the public mind, constantly associate those who oppose us with those names which already have a bad smell. The association will, after enough repetition, become fact in the public mind. We are bored. We're all bored now, but has it ever occurred to you, Wally, that the process that creates this boredom that we see in the world now may very well be a self-perpetuating, unconscious form of brainwashing created by a world totalitarian government based on money, and that all of this is much more dangerous than one thinks? And it's not just a question of individual survival, Wally, but that somebody who's bored is asleep, and somebody who's asleep will not say no? See, I keep meeting these people. I mean, uh, just a few days ago, I met this man whom I greatly admire. He's a Swedish physicist, Gustav Bjornstrand, and he told me that he no longer watches television, he doesn't read newspapers, and he doesn't read magazines. He's completely cut them out of his life because he really does feel that we're living in some kind of Orwellian nightmare now and that everything that you hear now contributes to turning you into a robot. And when I was at Findhorn, I met this extraordinary English tree expert, who had devoted his life to saving trees. Just got back from Washington, lobbying to save the redwoods. He's 84 years old. He always travels with a backpack because he never knows where he's going to be tomorrow. And when I met him at Findhorn, he said to me, where are you from? And I said, New York. He said, ah, New York. Yes, that's a very interesting place. Do you know a lot of New Yorkers who keep talking about the fact that they want to leave but never do? And I said, oh, yes. And he said, why do you think they don't leave? 
I gave him different banal theories. He said, oh, I don't think it's that way at all. He said, I think that New York is the new model for the new concentration camp, where the camp has been built by the inmates themselves, and the inmates are the guards, and they have this pride in this thing they've built. They've built their own prison, and so they exist in a state of schizophrenia, where they are both guards and prisoners, and as a result, they no longer have, having been lobotomized, the capacity to leave the prison they've made, or to even see it as a prison. And then he went into his pocket, and he took out a seed for a tree, and he said, this is a pine tree. He put it in my hand and he said, escape before it's too late. See, actually for two or three years now, Chiquita and I have had this very unpleasant feeling that we really should get out. And we really should feel like Jews in Germany in the late 30s. Get out of here. Of course, the problem is where to go, because it seems quite obvious that the whole world is going in the same direction. See, I think it's quite possible that the 1960s represented the last burst of the human being before he was extinguished. And that this is the beginning of the rest of the future now, that from now on there'll simply be all these robots walking around, feeling nothing, thinking nothing. And there'll be nobody left almost to remind them that there once was a species called a human being, with feelings and thoughts, and that history and memory are right now being erased, and soon nobody will really remember that life existed on the planet. Now, of course, Bjornstrand feels that there's really almost no hope, and that we're probably going back to a very savage, lawless, terrifying period. Finhorn people see it a little differently. They're feeling that there'll be these pockets of light springing up in different parts of the world, and that these will be, in a way, invisible planets on this planet and that as we or the world grow colder, we can take invisible space journeys to these different planets, refuel for what it is we need to do on the planet itself, and come back. And it's their feeling that there have to be centers now where people can come and reconstruct a new future for the world. And when I was talking to uh, Gustav Bjornstrand, he was saying that actually these centers are growing up everywhere now. And that what they're trying to do, which is what Finhorn was trying to do, and in a way, what I was trying to do, I mean, these things can't be given names, but in a way, these are all attempts at creating a new kind of school or a new kind of monastery. And Bjornstrand talks about the concept of reserves, islands of safety, where history can be remembered and the human being can continue to function in order to maintain the species through a dark age. In other words, we're talking about an underground. Did you ever read uh, James Baldwin, Sophie? I have read some James Baldwin. What I find striking every time that I sort of interact with that idea of white power and black power is that those myths, as you were talking about, those capitalist myths are so prevalent today. They're so real today. Like the myths that we have about black power, like black power, Wakanda, it's still a world where Africa was never colonized, was never pillaged for its resources. Mm -hmm. Like white power is Trump Tower. Like these things are put against each other. But when we say we want to kill Whitey, we don't really mean we want to kill Whitey, we do. But when we say we want to kill Whitey, <laughs> it's like a capitalist, it's a capitalist, today. not today. Finish the show. But when people react to people saying that the white privilege, whiteness is a capitalist structure, it benefits Absolutely. itself, it hurts white people, it hurts non-black people, it hurts black people, but still this kind of fear of a black alternative. And it's these sort of rhetorics battled against each other, I mean, these extreme capitalist ret rhetorics of supremacy. You can't do this to me! I'll strike! The state forbids strikes. Wait till the union hears about this! Ah yes, the union. Welcome to our ranks, number 1313. I'll take this case to the Supreme Court. The state is the Supreme Court. Our decision is as follows. No more private property. No more you. Well, the farm folk will put a stop to this. Farmers don't vote anymore. Well, what'll I do for seed next year? 
You won't have to worry about next year. The state will do your planning from now on. We must fight to regain our freedom or everything is lost. Everything! Everything is fine. 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 When anybody preaches disunity, tries to pit one of us against the other through class warfare, race hatred, or religious intolerance, you know that person seeks to rob us of our freedom and destroy our very lives. And we know what... Presently, the banks only have $4 billion on reserve, but they have loaned out over $1.5 trillion. To quote Graham Towers, each and every time a bank makes a loan, a new bank credit is created, new deposits for a new money. Broadly speaking, all new money comes out of a bank in the form of loans. As loans are debt, then under the present system, all money is debt. What I find interesting is even Jesus in Matthew 21 drove out the money changers in the temple because they were manipulating the currency to steal money from the people. The private banks are just like the money changers in Matthew 21. They are defrauding and robbing the people of Canada, thus their freedom, and they need to be stopped. How should the banking system work? In an infamous interview, Mr. McGeer asked Mr. Towers, can you tell me why a government with power to create money should give that power away to a private mon monopoly and then borrow that which Parliament can create itself back at interest to the point of national bankruptcy? Mr. Towers replied, if Parliament wants to change the form of operating the banking system, then certainly that is within the powers of Parliament. In other words, if the Canadian government needs money, they can borrow it directly from the Bank of Canada. The people would then pay fair taxes to repay the Bank of Canada. This tax money would in turn get injected back into our economic infrastructure and the debt would be wiped out. Canadians would again prosper with real money as the foundation of our economic structure and not debt money. Regarding the debt money owed to the private banks, such as the Royal Bank, we would simply have the Bank of Canada print the money owing, hand it over to the private banks and then clear the debt with the Bank of Canada. And yes, we have the power and lawful right to do so. In conclusion, it has become painfully obvious, even for me, a 12-year-old Canadian, that we are being defrauded and robbed by the banking system and a composite government. What will we do to stop this crime? What will we do to ensure that the next generation will live free and clear of the debt-based economy that enslaves them to the banks? Margaret Mead said the following, and I hope that all of you remember this. Never doubt that a small group of people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you.